I thought I'd start by talking about what would happen if there wasn't a greenhouse effect, just to try and convince you that there is a greenhouse effect. Here's a picture of what the world would look like with no greenhouse effect. So you've got the sun shining down on the Earth, mainly sort of optical wavelengths, so relatively short wavelengths, and you can calculate how much energy that delivers to the Earth. And it's a slightly complicated calculation because some fraction of the sunlight gets reflected off clouds, some of it gets reflected straight back from snow, doesn't get absorbed by the Earth. Sometimes the sun's below the horizon, sometimes the sun's not directly overhead, but nonetheless you can factor all those things in. But a certain amount per unit area arrives at the Earth, let's call that F and that warms up the Earth. The Earth gets warmer and warmer. The net effect when something warms up is it starts giving out radiation itself. Um, and so the Earth is gonna warm up to a point where it's giving out radiation and the amount of radiation it gives out depends on the temperature by a thing called Stefan's Law, which basically says that the amount of energy that the Earth then re-radiates back into space is given by that formula where this thing is Stefan's constant sigma and then this is the temperature of the Earth, T zero to the fourth power. And of course what's gonna happen is things are gonna keep heating up and heating up and as the Earth heats up, of course, this number gets bigger and bigger, which means eventually you reach a point of equilibrium where there's as much energy coming in as there is going out. And so that should then dictate what the equilibrium temperature of the Earth actually is. And if you stick the numbers in, it turns out that the temperature you get out is about 255 Kelvin, which is minus 18 centigrade. Um, which is pretty chilly, and so clearly we're missing something. So that should, that's like the default temperature that the Earth should be with the sun where it is? and Absolutely. That's the and in fact, interestingly, it is about the temperature of the moon. The average temperature of the moon is about minus 18, minus 20 centigrade, um, because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, and so that really is the end of the story as far as a body like the moon's concerned. Clearly the Earth is not at minus 18 degrees centigrade, and that's where the greenhouse effect kicks in and keeps us nice and warm. Okay, so now, now I need another picture. So the complicating factor is that we have an atmosphere. So the atmosphere interacts with radiation, and in particular, it tends to be better at absorbing longer wavelengths of light. And so to a first approximation, the sunlight that's coming down just comes straight down through the atmosphere uh, and doesn't really care. And I've, here, let's really simplify the atmosphere. Let's treat the atmosphere as if it were just a thin layer, or at least the bit of the atmosphere that's doing the greenhouse effect. Let's just treat it as a, just a single thin layer. You can think of it as like a, a window pane, if you like, that actually lets normal wavelengths of light, optical wavelengths of light through, but it is very good at absorbing infrared light. Why didn't it get absorbed on the way in? So because the wavelengths are different, right? Because the, the sunlight is mostly optical light and the radiation that the Earth's are missing is mainly infrared, and various gases like water vapor and carbon dioxide are very good at absorbing infrared, but they're basically transparent to optical light. Like a um, one-way street. Yeah, or actually like a sheet of glass, because a lot normal glass is for, lets optical light through, but actually absorbs infrared light. So it really is, you know, it behaves in much the same way as a, a sheet of glass does. What's the story here? Well, we've got the same radiation coming down to the Earth, F, and then, well, we don't know how much it heats the temperature up on the surface of the Earth yet, so let's give it a different name for what we gave it before. So it's gonna, if it heats it up to some temperature, T1, let's call it. So we had T0 before. Then the radiation it gives out gets bounced back up it heats up this layer of gas in the atmosphere. Of course, the same thing's gonna happen there, right? It's gonna heat up and heat up and heat up, and as it heats up, it's gonna start radiating itself. And so it's actually gonna start producing radiation depending on its temperature. The slight difference of what we had before, of course, is this layer has two sides, which means that some of it gets radiated downwards and some gets radiated upwards. And in fact, because it's symmetric, you get the same amount coming down, it's going up. And for the equilibrium that we had before, we know what this temperature has to be because we know that the amount of energy coming in, the F we had before, the amount of energy coming in, has to be equal to the amount of energy which is ultimately making it out. From the picture we had before, we know what that equilibrium is, that we actually just end up with a T0 we had before, and that would balance the F coming in. So now to balance the F coming in, that means this layer needs to heat up to some temperature T0, so that the energy coming out is sigma T0 to the fourth. But because this layer radiates both ways, that also means it radiates back down again, an amount of energy sigma t0 to the fourth as well. And we know what the number needed to make things come out right in this case is because it has to be the same amount of energy coming in. This is the only source of energy escaping. So the amount of energy coming in has to be equal to the amount of energy coming out. And we've already done the calculation for that. We know that this layer has to heat up to minus 18 degrees centigrade to produce the right amount of outgoing energy. So that was doing the kind of the sums for this layer up here, but we can do the sum at ground level now which is that we know that the amount of energy coming in has to be equal to, and now we've got two sources of energy coming in, because there's the energy that's radiated back down again, as well as the stuff that's coming straight from the sun, has to be equal to the amount of energy coming out. Energy coming in is equal to F, but we already know that F from what we had before is equal to sigma T0 to the fourth. So we've got energy in, sigma T0 
to the fourth, that's coming in. And then there's another sigma two zero to the fourth coming from the stuff that's radiated back down again from the layer above our head. So we've got two lots of that is equal to the energy that's going out, sigma t1 to the power four. And then we can do a little mathematics of just cancelling, cancelling the sigmas on both sides. And then we need to take a fourth root of both sides, which tells us that t1 is equal to, so we take the fourth root of that, t to the one quarter power t0, which works out it's about 1.2 times t0. So this is saying that the actual temperature that the Earth heats up to because of this kind of blanketing layer above our heads is about 20% higher than it would have been in the absence of anything above our heads. And that works out if you go through the maths again, you have to do everything in Kelvin rather than centigrade. It works out that the ultimate, the temperature uh, of the Earth would end up being about 30 centigrade. So we've kind of overcooked it a bit because the average temperature of the Earth isn't about 30 centigrade. But you can see that for, by this mechanism, you can easily make the surface of the Earth heat up much more. We haven't broken any laws of physics to do this. Various people kind of think that this breaks the second law of thermodynamics or one of those other things. It really doesn't. You can see all the heat flow here. It's always heat is flowing from hotter things to cooler things. There's no energy being created anywhere in this process. It's just redistributing the energy a bit. And also, it seems that you've assumed this layer is very perfect, like, a, like a, it takes everything in, like there's no leakage. Th that's true, and in fact, if you make it so that, you know, you could make it so that instead of exact absorbing all everything that comes in, it could absorb a certain fraction of it. And it turns out by tuning that parameter, you can change this 1.2 factor down to actually get the surface temperature of the Earth right. It's probably not the right thing to do because we've clearly got a very simplified model of what's going on in the atmosphere here. And really this is just to illustrate the kind of the size of the effect you can get just by putting a blanketing layer above the Earth. But it captures some of the essential physics of what's going on. So what does it capture? It captures the fact that the real balance, the, so the, you know, if you, if you do the naive calculation and you end up with your minus 18 degrees centigrade, that balance has to be there. But the important thing to be aware of is that balance is between the energy coming in and the energy where it's last kind of leaving the Earth, so the, the layer from which the energy actually escapes. So that is indeed, you know, the balance that you would expect, that the energy in is equal to the energy out, which means this layer ends up at minus 18 degrees. But then, in order to get the energy back from the ground to here, the second law of thermodynamics essentially says that in order to get heat to travel from here up to here, this ground has to be at a higher temperature than that layer there. So that's the reason why you end up with a higher temperature on the ground than that naive minus 18 degrees centigrade is because you somehow have to get the energy from that layer to the point where it's radiated back into space. Mm -hmm. We've clearly cheated quite dramatically here to get this picture though. A couple of the missing pieces of physics. One is that I kind of drew this as if the only way the energy gets back out away from the surface of the Earth is by radiation. Turns out there are other processes that get the, the heat from the surface of the Earth up at least through the lower levels of the atmosphere. Like what? Well, the, probably the most important one is actually is convective effect. So actually taking parcels of air and then just physically moving upwards. And what happens when a parcel of air moves is that, so you've got a parcel of warmish air at, at ground level. As it rises, the pressure of the air around it decreases, so it expands. And when you take a gas and expand it, it actually cools. A thing called a, a adiabatic expansion. It's just basically as you expand it, it cools down. Similarly, if, if you've got a sinking parcel of air, as it sinks down, the pressure around it increases and it gets compressed. And if ever you've stuck your thumb over the end of a bicycle pump and pushed the pump in, you know that when you compress the gas in there, it actually heats up. You can feel your thumb getting warm. Same here, the heat as it sinks uh, will naturally heat up. That creates a, a kind of a, a temperature gradient. So as well as transporting energy around, that you're lifting energy up and, and bringing you know, hot air rising, cooler air sinking. But actually that in itself will create a temperature gradient in the atmosphere, that as things lower, they tend to increase in temperature. As they go up and expand, they cool. That creates a thing called the adiabatic lapse rate, which just basically means that as you go up through the atmosphere, the temperature cools down just naturally nothing to do with radiation processes, just to do with the kind of the gas physics that's going on. It's a little further complicated because there's water vapor in the atmosphere and actually water can also transfer energy around because water can go from its liquid form to its vapor form. So there are other processes that, that move energy around, but the, 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 the important aspect for this discussion is actually as well as them moving energy around, they create a temperature gradient in the atmosphere. It turns out that that simple calculation of the adiabatic lapse rate isn't quite right because of the water vapor and all those other things. It works out that the temperature as you go up through the Earth's atmosphere drops by about six or seven degrees centigrade for every kilometer you go up. 
just because of these physical processes that's going on in the atmosphere. So that's why it's cold when you go up into the mountains? Exactly, and it really, the, the main driving physics is exactly this effect that as air expands, as it rises, it cools down. And so that means that, that every time you go up a kilometre, it'll be about six and a half degrees cooler on average. So that's one part of the physics we're missing. The other part of the physics we're missing is this blatant cheat of putting all those greenhouse gases in a single thin layer, whereas actually, of course, they're spread through the atmosphere like all the other gases are. And it turns out when you put those two factors in, this lapse rate, the rate at which the temperature is going down as you go above the atmosphere, and the fact that the greenhouse gases are kind of distributed through the atmosphere, that actually gives you a much more, a fuller picture of what's going on of the real physics behind the greenhouse effect. Here's an attempt at a slightly more realistic picture of what's really going on. What I'm trying to draw here is a kind of a cartoon view of the atmosphere. So the dots are all the molecules in the atmosphere, and the red dots are the greenhouse gases, so the things that absorb the infrared radiation as they're trying to get out. You heat up the ground, the ground starts transferring that energy back up, some of it through convection, some of it through radiation, some of it through the water cycle. So basically the energy starts waking its way up through the atmosphere. Eventually it reaches a point where it can escape from the atmosphere. So it's like as, as if you were in a forest. As you're walking through the forest, when you're near the middle of the forest, all you see are trees in every direction. Eventually you get close enough to the edge of the forest that you can actually see your way out of the forest, you know, start seeing the, the space beyond. It's the same story here. You've got radiation bouncing around. In the, in, when it's all the way down here, it just can't see, you know, it keeps bouncing into where, whichever way it goes, it hits a, a, a greenhouse gas molecule, so it really can't see the edge. But eventually you reach a point where you're high enough in the atmosphere, there's, less, there's little enough of that gas above your head, the infrared radiation can just escape out there into space. And it, it's this level from which it's escaping, so we've got the same energy balance as before, this is where the energy is ultimately escaping into space, and that energy escaping has to be equal to the energy coming in. So this is the level of the atmosphere that you have to heat up to that minus 18 degrees centigrade in order to get the balance between the energy coming out and then the energy coming in. If you're an astronomer, you'd refer to it as a photosphere. It's kind of the, the radius. If it were a star, it's the radius within a star from which radiation is escaping. But it's kind of the, it's that sort of last scattering surface. It's where the radiation can actually escape from. It's at a, a certain altitude, exactly. And that's the altitude at which you end up with a temperature of minus 18 degrees. All right, so now let's do the experiment of introducing more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. So it's exactly the same story as before, that the radiation comes down, heats up the atmosphere, but what you can see is because there's now more red dots, you have to get higher up in the atmosphere to reach the point where actually you'll no longer have a red dot above your head. So actually higher in the atmosphere to reach the point where you can escape. So the only thing that's changed is the, the altitude at which you, you reach that, that point of balance where the radiation is getting out. And remember that's the altitude that has to be at minus 18 degrees. But the other thing that we saw before is that actually as you go up through the atmosphere, the temperature drops by an amount which is kind of set by the properties of the atmosphere of about six and a half degrees per kilometer you go up. Another way of thinking about that is to say if you come down through the atmosphere, for every kilometer you come down, the temperature goes up by six and a half degrees. So that means that the difference between these two pictures is that in the upper one, you don't have very many kilometers to go down, which means that it's minus 18 degrees here, and there's not very many kilometers, which means each time you go down a kilometer, it goes up by six and a half degrees. It's not gonna be that much above minus 18 degrees by the time you get to the ground. Here, because that minus 18 degree point is way up above your head, then there are many more kilometers to come down to, which means that each time you go down, you go up by another six and a half degrees. That means the ground's temperature here is gonna be much higher than the ground's temperature was here, just because you've gone up by many more lots of six and a half degrees than you did in the first picture. That's why the temperature at the surface is sensitive to how much of the greenhouse gas there is above your head. Because the more greenhouse gas there is above your head, the further above your head that minus 18 degree centigrade level is, which means when you come back down through the atmosphere, you end up with a higher temperature when you get to the ground than you do when that minus 18 degree layer is closer to the ground. What happens is you just keep adding heat and adding heat and adding heat and making things warm up until you reach that equilibrium. So you're just adding energy to the earth essentially until it, it manages to reach an equilibrium. So the, the, you've got, when it's 30 degrees on the surface, you've, clearly, you've got more energy stored in the earth than you had before. But you've got plenty of time to collect it. It just gathers it from the sun over time. It's just it's better at holding on to it when you've got that kind of blanket above your head. So nothing I've said here is particularly controversial in that actually the physics is, of all this is pretty well understood. The controversial part is how sensitive the atmosphere is to the addition of extra greenhouse gas and in particular carbon dioxide. The reason why that's not as straightforward to calculate as it would appear from what I've just waved my hands about and explained is that actually the addition of the carbon dioxide is not the whole story. 
For example, if you were to add a certain amount of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it would heat things up a bit, but then what else happens? You made the atmosphere a bit warmer, that means that actually it can hold on to more water vapor, because actually if you make air hotter, it can actually have more water vapor in it. Water vapor is another very strong greenhouse gas, so suddenly we've got another greenhouse gas being added to the atmosphere. You might imagine if you warm things up a bit, you might melt the snow, for example, might some of the snow and ice. That's actually reflecting sunlight back straight back into space. So suddenly now the Earth is absorbing more energy than it was before. You might change the amount of clouds, and it's not clear whether you increase them or decrease them. Again, that can just reflect sunlight straight back up again. So there are kind of knock-on effects of adding more CO2 to the atmosphere. Generally, they're, they, they make things worse or warmer, depending on your perspective. So there's kind of an amplifying effect, the sort of a feedback effect and an amplifying effect. And all the argument about how much the Earth will warm up as we add more CO2 to the atmosphere is all to do with how big those amplifying effects are. There is still quite a range of uncertainty as to what that sensitivity is. When you add a certain amount more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, how much the temperature goes up isn't because of the physics I've just been talking about, it's because of all those knock-on consequences which are quite complicated. Naively, you kind of might think that this is how a greenhouse works, because a greenhouse is covered in glass, glass has this property that it lets optical light through but absorbs infrared. So you could have a picture of a greenhouse whereby you've got the sunlight coming in, letting the energy in through it, and then the, it warms up the ground inside the greenhouse, that then re-radiates but is trapped by the glass because it can't get through, which is very much like the picture we were talking about for the greenhouse effect. Turns out that's not the main process in greenhouses, and people have even done the experiment. There are particular kinds of glass you can make which are transparent to infrared radiation. And if you made a greenhouse out of glass which is transparent to both optical and infrared radiation, if that was what was going on, the greenhouse wouldn't work anymore. It turns out greenhouse still gets nice and warm even if you make it out of this special glass. And it's really because, actually, because there are these other processes that transfer energy around, and in particular this convective thing, this movement of air, that's what really heats up a greenhouse. But as the air heats up in the greenhouse, it would like to rise and take that heat away, but it can't because the greenhouse keeps it in. And that's really the main physics of why greenhouses get warm. So it's the trapping of the air, not the trapping of the energy in the light. Exactly, and actually inhibiting one of these other processes that transfers energy around convection, not actually inhibiting radiation is the reason why greenhouses get warm. Talk to me about Venus. We always Venus is famously portrayed as this runaway greenhouse effect. Is that true? Yeah, so that's very bad news. In principle, you can reach a point where as you heat up the air, it can actually have more water vapor in it. It can hold more water vapor, which increases the greenhouse effect. If things are very bad, you can get into a situation where if you had a planet with oceans on it, it starts to heat up, the oceans start to evaporate, that increases the greenhouse effect, which means that the surface gets warmer, which means that warm water evaporates, which means that the thing gets hot, and so you can have this kind of feed, runaway feedback process. And it's thought what happened with Venus is that once upon a time, Venus has had oceans rather like the Earth. It got into this bad cycle of this runaway greenhouse effect, which effectively just evaporated the entire oceans, and you ended up with this incredibly high temperature. The inhabitants of Venus are, or rather were, far in advance of us in the applications of physics. It's a slightly strange picture because if you look at Venus's atmosphere now, there's essentially no water vapour in it. That picture sounds complete rubbish, right, because I've just told you the reason why it ended up so hot is because there's lots of water vapour in the atmosphere, but actually there isn't today. The extra piece of physics is having done that, then what happens is as the water vapour ends up high in the atmosphere, it photo dissociates it. The hydrogen then fritters out into space because it's very light, it escapes very easily. The oxygen then combines with carbon to create carbon dioxide and so you end up with conventional greenhouse gases. The other bad news for, for Venus is because you've eliminated all the oceans, one of the good things that the Earth's oceans do is that they're very good at absorbing carbon dioxide. Of course on Venus we've just evaporated all the oceans, so any carbon dioxide that's been created by volcanoes and any other processes just stays there in the atmosphere. The other thing that happened in Venus is it doesn't have any plate tectonics, which also might be related to the absence of oceans. And again, plate tectonics, because they kind of suck rock down into the core of the planet, are another good way of getting rid of your carbon. Having lost all its oceans and ended up very hot because of that, then all the water vapour ended up going away, but the greenhouse effect didn't because then carbon dioxide really took over. Is the big danger that your photosphere gets so high that you start boiling water on the surface of your planet? 
it's not quite boiling, it's just evaporating. So just like water, you know, well below boiling point, you, you're losing water vapor off the surface. But it is, it is exactly that, that it, things heat up on the surface to a point where you're losing the water vapor so quickly that you get into this runaway cycle of creating more and more greenhouse gases. The people who are looking at greenhouse gases and what have you on Earth, the IPCC, are, are pretty definitive that we're nowhere near that point. Right? We're not going to have a runaway greenhouse effect. So all, despite all the doom and gloom you hear, this is at least one extremely bad thing where we're still a long way from it happening. So there's plenty of other bad things that would happen first, but at least we're not near that point for the Earth. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to see more about weather phenomena with Professor Merrifield, we've done a few now. I'll put a link to a playlist on the screen and down in the video description. Also in the description, a link to our Patreon page and a couple of podcasts that I've been doing lately you might want to check out. We'll see you here again soon for another video on 60 Symbols.